Uh, we're continuing a series that we uh, started uh, in the beginning of the summer. Uh, we've been working through uh, Revelation. We've been going through the seven churches in Revelation. And the title of this series is called Lampstand. And the reason it's called Lampstand is because in Revelation, Jesus appears to the Apostle John. And uh, this is a, a very older John. This is John. He's in his 80s. And he has been sentenced to the island of Patmos uh, because of his faith. All the other disciples at this point have been martyred. And he's the only last surviving apostle. And Jesus appears to him and he reveals to John his glory. And through this, John sees this vision of seven golden lampstands. And these seven golden lampstands represent seven churches that are in Asia. And so Revelation was meant to be a letter uh, that was meant to be carried to these seven churches. And it was to be read out loud to these seven churches. And so what's interesting about this is Jesus has a particular message to each of these seven churches. Uh, but at the same time, this message is supposed to be preached today. Uh, the number seven means wholeness. It means complete. And so the message is not only for the churches of then, but is also the message of the churches today. I believe Jesus chose these seven churches because there was a lot more than seven churches in Asia. But Jesus chose these seven churches because I believe there are particular things that Jesus wanted to be preached to the universal church. And so we've been going through this. Um, so today we actually come to the fifth church, um, we're actually going to skip over Smyrna, if you've been following along, and we're going to combine, uh, actually, yeah, it's, uh, Sardis, not Smyrna. Uh, we're going to skip over Sardis, and we're going to combine Sardis and Laodicea next week, and we're going to wrap it all up next Sunday. Uh, so we're skipping over Sardis, but today we have come to the Church of Philadelphia, and today I've entitled my message, Open doors, open doors. And so we're going to do something a little different this morning. Uh, when I was on vacation, I read an article uh, about the importance of reading aloud the scripture in its entirety and its, in its context, because uh, really in America, uh, so many people today uh, don't read the Bible, and, and so they don't read the Bible in its, in, in its context and in its entirety. And so it talked about the importance of churches reading aloud the scripture and reading it uh, in its context. And so we're going to do something a little different. Uh, Pastor K.R. actually does this when he preaches, and I always appreciate that. Uh, we're going to stand and we're going to read Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. So can we do that? We're going to read it in its entirety, okay? Uh, and then we're going to break this down. And I have it on the screen if you don't have a Bible. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. This is what the word of the Lord says. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, that you have kept my word and you've not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be of the Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my commands and endured patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Since you have kept my command and endured patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much today for your word. Uh, Lord, I really believe that this word is, is, has been pressed upon my heart. I believe that there is a message today that you want to speak to your people. And so today I just pray, God, that you just open our hearts and open our minds, Lord, to, to hear clearly, Lord, what you're speaking to us today. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
So when we think about the Church of Philadelphia, I know what I think of. I think of the city of Philadelphia. How about you? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the, the birthplace of the Declaration of Independence, the Liberty Bell, Betsy Ross, the American flag, the city of brotherly love. If you're a sports fan, I know we have a couple in here that are Philadelphia fans, yeah? The Eagles, right? The Sixers. We do also have a Steelers fan in here, but we won't, you know. Did somebody boo? No, no, okay, no, no, okay. We're Christian, all right. But the city in uh, Revelation is not Pennsylvania. It's not Pennsylvania. This city is located in what, uh, what we know as modern Turkey. I actually have a a map on the screen. It, how many of you like our new projector? Has anybody noticed our, our projector? You can see it. <laughs> we, we had a projector that was going bad. So, uh, But uh, today it is the uh, city of Al-Sahir. I might be pronouncing that wrong on a world map. Uh, it was called Philadelphia, though, during the time uh, because of its founder, Atlantis II Philadelphus. Say that a few hundred times. Um, we'll actually note, though, in this passage that uh, the city of Philadelphia is the smallest um, of the seven uh, cities that are mentioned in Revelation. It was most likely the smallest church of all the other churches that Jesus mentions here. It was known for its uh, vineyards. It was known for its production of wine and also raisins. Uh, but the city also uh, was prone to earthquakes. Uh, the city was destroyed and rebuilt several times uh, in history. And so as we look at this passage this morning, what's interesting is, is uh, Philadelphia is only one of two churches in which Jesus does not call the church to some sort of repentance. Uh, the other church is the church of Smyrna. We already covered that. That's the persecuted church. Uh, Smyrna and Philadelphia are the only two churches that Jesus doesn't call them to some sort of turning around. And the main message that Jesus has to the church of Philadelphia is, is I have prepared for you a place of open doors. I have an open door for you. How many of you have a keychain that you have, that you carry around everywhere? Anybody have, today, you know, uh, maybe we don't carry as many keychains. I, for, for a few years, I was a custodian of, of one of our churches. That's how I started in ministry. And it was like, you know, one of the, anybody ever have like a really big keychain where you have like a ton of keys and it just, you know, like your whole pocket would just like, and then it would scrape your legs. I'd always have scratches on my legs because the keys were constantly rubbing up and down my legs. But you know, keys give us access, right? I have a, a I forgot to bring it up here. I was going to bring it up here, but I, I forgot. But I have a, a keychain for the, for the church and all the different things that we have to get in for the church. I have a key to get in the church trailer that has all of our equipment in here. I mean, everything that we see in here is in a church trailer, and we have a key for that. Uh, we have keys for certain areas that we can get in in the school. How many of you are thankful that the school allows us into certain areas, right? And so we have, we're blessed here at Woodward Granger to do that. But so, you know, we have keys to get in certain rooms in the school. I have a key to access my house, even though most of the time we keep our door unlocked. So don't tell, don't tell too many people that. But I have a key to access my car. We lived in a small town for 12 years. I have to keep reminding my wife, we have to lock the doors. But anyways, um, so keys give us access, right? And so in this passage in Revelation, notice here that J Jesus starts off by saying this. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of who? David. David. Now, what's that all about? Jesus holds the keys of David. Uh, what we have to understand, and most of the time in the New Testament, when David is mentioned, it's referring to the covenant that God made with David. God made a covenant with David when he was king that his kingdom would never end. It would be an eternal kingdom. There would always be someone from the line of David that would sit on the throne. Okay, That was a covenant God made with David. But if you look at the history of Israel, what you see is say, well, wait a minute, that didn't actually happen. 
Because as you read in the in first and second Kings, you read that after David was Solomon and then after Solomon, the, the kingdom actually split into two. There were some good kings, there were some wicked kings. And eventually, most of the time, it was just wicked kings. They turned away from the worship of the Lord. They started worshiping idols. And eventually, Babylon came into Israel and totally destroyed the nation and took many of the Jewish people captive into Babylon. I said, well, what about the covenant that God made with David about this eternal kingdom that would never end? I find it interesting that in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, in this passage, the prophet Isaiah is actually speaking to the captives, the Jewish captives that were in Babylon that were wondering the same thing. God, what about your covenant? What about your promise of this eternal kingdom? And notice what the prophet says. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Sounds a lot like Revelation, doesn't it? It's actually a parallel passage here. Jesus is the fulfillment of this promise. The promise that Isaiah is talking about of the one of the house of David, the one who can open doors that no one can shut, that uh, that when the door is shut, no one can open. What he is referring to here is Jesus. Jesus is of the line of David. He is the fulfillment of this promise. But the kingdom that the prophet is talking about is not an earthly kingdom, but it is an eternal kingdom. And that's what Jesus came to establish. And so in this passage in Revelation here, Jesus is the one who is holding the keys. So Jesus is the one who has been granted all authority. If you have keys, you have authority. For example, I do a chaplaincy that I do on Tuesdays and I go into this place. They make micro molds. They do these little micro molds. And I have a key card. So a lot of, a lot of business today have gone away from actual physical keys. They have key cards. And so I have access to a lot of the areas of the building that I can go visit employees, but there are certain areas that I have not been granted access. And the reason is because is that they make these little micro molds and they have to wear these uh, special garbs, they have to wear goggles, they have to wear head caps because they don't want any sort of dust or anything getting on these little molds that they're making because a lot of them are used in hospitals. So I can use my key card on that lock and it's not going to work. Every time it's going to be red. I don't have access. I don't have access to that area. I don't have the authority to get in that area. Am I making sense? And so what Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, I hold the keys of David. Jesus is saying, I have all authority. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Jesus has been given all authority. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus because he is the mediator between us and God. We pray in his name to the Father because he has been granted all authority. When Jesus died on the cross, he was put in the grave. Three days later, he rose again. And then after 40 days, Jesus ascended and he is now at the right hand of God. You know, the right hand represents authority. It represents equal status. And so Jesus sits at the right hand and he holds the keys. He has all authority. And so in Revelation, what this is saying here is he is in charge of open and closed doors. He holds the keys. So what can we learn? What can we can learn from this? Well, how many of you know this morning that in life, there's sometimes open doors and sometimes there's closed doors? Has anybody ever experienced some open doors and closed doors in your life? <laughs> Uh, okay, the rest of you are lying, okay? We'll pray for you at the end of the service. I have. Sometimes it seems like doors just open. They just fly open. You pray a prayer and God opens that door. You see an opportunity and you walk right through it and it just seems like everything goes as planned. But there are other times things don't go as planned. There's other times that you pray and you think, man, this has got to be God's will. This has got to be the step that I'm supposed to take. Or you might be in the middle of something and all of a sudden just the door, just boom, the door shuts. You're like, what is this all about? 
Why is this door closed? Why, why is this opportunity? Why is this dream maybe shut? Or why is this prayer not answered? Or what was the reason that things didn't go exactly as expected? In life, we all experience moments where there are open doors and closed doors. So what does this all mean for us today? Well, this morning, I want to give you three points that I, I believe that we can learn from the Church of Philadelphia. Three things that we can learn from the Church of Philadelphia. And here's the first thing. Number one, I think the first thing we can learn from this is God is sovereign. Now, what does that mean? It means God's in charge. <laughs> he rules and reigns. In the word sovereign, you can find the word reign. And God sees all, he knows all. He has all wisdom. He holds the keys, he's in control. And so since Jesus is in control, and he has all authority, then that means we come under that authority and we submit to that authority. I want to go back to Jesus's words here to the church of Philadelphia. It says, when he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Do you see that Jesus is in charge? He's the one in charge. He's the one who's in charge of the open doors. He's in charge of the closed doors. He is sovereign over all. And so we submit to that. In life, sometimes we have closed doors, and those doors can be disappointing. Sometimes when we have closed doors, it can be discouraging. But I want you to hold on to this truth. Just because there is a closed door doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. In fact, here's what I believe. Sometimes when there's a closed door, there's a better door that's going to be opening soon. Because God knows God knows the Apostle Paul uh, experienced this. If you read in his missionary journeys, there are times where Paul had a plan. This is the way we're going to go. This is the city we're going to visit. This is the place we're going to plant a church. And he had a plan, but then God redirected his plan. Uh, you read in Acts chapter 16, you can read it some other time, but, but Paul had this plan to start a church in Phygeria. And in this place, the Holy Spirit, the scripture says that the Holy Spirit actually forbade Paul from going there for some reason. And Paul didn't understand. It was a closed door. God, what are you doing? But in the middle of the night, Paul has a vision of a man from Macedonia and he's calling out to Paul and he's saying, Paul, come over here and preach the gospel to us. So what seemed to be a closed door, God opened another door for Paul to go into Macedonia. So sometimes we may not understand, but I believe when God closes a door, there's going to be a new door of opportunity. You might be laid off from your job. Maybe your dream didn't come as, as maybe you thought. Maybe a relationship didn't work out. Listen, don't settle in discouragement and disappointment. Don't stay there. Believe that God is going to open a new door for you. In fact, if you're taking notes this morning, I think you should write this down. This is so good. If God closes a door, it's not a rejection. It's just a redirection. I'm going to say that again. If God closes the door, it's not a rejection. God has not rejected you. It's a redirection. God is going to redirect you in another direction and just believe that it's going to be better than the closed door that, that was closed previously. Believe that. I know from my life, sometimes that when there's a closed door and some, you know, it's like you're trying, you're trying to push that door open and you're trying to do everything to get that door open and you don't understand why the door's not opening. But then later there's another open door and you walk through that door. And then I know for, for me that, that later in life, I look back at that closed door and I'm thankful that God closed the door. That God was actually protecting me from something. Uh, boy, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to go into details, but I, I, could sh I, I could share a few stories in my life where God redirected us in another area. In fact, God redirected us here to Granger. And I'm not going to get into those details, but, but God redirected us here. And, and we didn't understand why God had called us to start all over and to start a church. You know, we were in a very comfortable church 
and, and things were going very well for us. And we didn't understand why God was closing that door and to start all over, to move our family of seven to a new community and to start all over. But, but listen, there are sometimes things that you look back at and you say, you know what? God was actually protecting me from something that happened that, that, that you know, I wasn't aware of at the time, but now I know that God was actually protecting our family and he was redirecting us. And sometimes you don't see it when the door is closed. You don't see what God is doing. But just trust in him. Trust that he knows best. Trust that he is sovereign. He is sovereign and he knows what's best for you. Here's number two. I think the second thing we can learn from this is that God uses the small things. God uses the small things. Now remember I said earlier that the Church of Philadelphia was the smallest city and probably the smallest church. But I want to go back to the Jesus' words again. It says, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Some versions of this passage says, I know that you have little power. I know that you have little power. Yeah, you might want to write this down. They had little power, but they had great potential. Little power, but great potential. Great potential because the city was strategically located. Even though it wasn't the biggest city, the biggest church, it was on the route to the bigger cities. It was on a trade route. And so a lot of people were traveling through the city of Philadelphia. And what Jesus was saying here, it doesn't matter what your size is. God wants to use you. You are strategically located in the place that you're at right now so that when people are traveling through, you get the opportunity to preach the gospel to all these peoples of different cultures and different nations. God has strategically put you there. Don't think God can't use you because of your size. You go back to the story of David. Remember, before David was the king of Israel, he was a shepherd boy, right? You remember the story in 1 Samuel? When the prophet Samuel came, God led him to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem. He says, to his, he says to Jesse, the dad, hey, bring out your sons. Jesse brings out his boys. But yet he forgets one. <laughs> How would you like to be, the, the, you know, the kid that you, your dad forgets you, you know? And he brings, he brings the sons out. And Samuel looks at the tallest, the most handsome son. He says, oh, man, that's got to be the next king of Israel. He's good looking. He's tall, you know. And... God, God rebukes Samuel. God says, no, I don't look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. And Samuel's like, do you have any more kids? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like you know, oh yeah, <laughs> I forgot one. <laughs> He's out with the sheep. He calls in David. David's probably all muddy and dirty and he walks in and God says, that's my boy. That's my boy. And God has uh, Samuel anoint him as the next king of Israel. Small beginnings, right? The 12 disciples, they were nobodies, fishermen, tax collectors. And yet God used them to turn the world upside down. So here's something that I would like you to pray. God, open my eyes to open doors of opportunities. God, open my eyes to open doors of opportunities. Because I think sometimes when it comes to open doors, we, we have wrong mindsets when it comes to open doors. See, what do you mean by that, Pastor Todd? Wrong mindsets. I think the first wrong mindset is God can't use me. That's a wrong mindset. You say, I'm not a pastor. I don't know the Bible very well. My coworkers would never listen to me. They'd never come to church if I invited them. Listen, God can use you. That's a lie from the devil. It's a lie from the devil. God can use you. As we get ready for Friends and Family Sunday, begin to pray. I want you to pray that God, let there be open doors of opportunities for me to invite my family and friends. Begin to pray that as we get in our 21 days. God, how can you use me to invite people? How can I share of your love? How, how can I show kindness to somebody? So don't have the mindset that God can't use me. I think another wrong mindset is this, though. And I think this is, this is something that, that as a pastor, I have, I have seen quite a bit. And that is sometimes we pass up open doors because we might think that that, 
that opportunity is too small. And, and this is something that I've seen, especially when it comes to, as a pastor, as we're trying to raise up another generation of ministers, this is the struggle that we have in our fellowship. Zechariah 4.10 says, Do not despise small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Do not despise small beginnings. We, we live in a culture today of social media, and our younger generation, they see reels. And of course, reels are, are generated through algorithms and, and of course, through likes. So, th so the more people like things, the more they're going to show up on your, on your reels. And that's what people see the most, most of the time. So what a lot of our younger generation who is in the church world, what they see is they see the mega church. And they see worship bands you know, big stages, lights, and, and thousands of people, and they see the big stage, and they see, you know, uh, preachers preaching. And, and so a lot of our younger generation that want to go into ministry, that's what they want. They want the big stage. They want the thousands of people. And so this is an issue that we're having in the Assemblies of God right now. In fact, I spoke to a professor at, at one of our Bible colleges here a few years ago, and they were talking to me about how can we raise up younger people into the ministry that will go to the rural church, that will go to the small towns, that will go to the smaller churches. Even in Iowa right now, I think we have seven or eight churches that are open that we can't get pastors to go to. Pastor K. Hart goes to one a lot, quite a bit because he's filling in because they can't get a pastor to go to the town. It's a problem. It's a problem. And we are raising up younger ministers, but they're getting sucked in by the megachurch. And again, I don't have anything wrong with the megachurch, but when we have this attitude that I'm too good to be in a small town or I'm too good to be on a small stage, then listen, again, remember, David, before he led the thousands in Israel, he led the sheep. Nobody saw him, yet he was faithful and God blessed him. So that's a wrong mindset. It's the wrong mindset. So we have to be careful. God, God started me in ministry. I started teaching second graders. I started teaching a Sunday school class. Then God led me to teach kids church. I led children's ministry for several years. And then from there, somebody saw a gift in me that I was able to teach. So they gave me Wednesday night adult Bible studies. So I was able to teach on Wednesday nights. From there, God opened another door that we were then doing a young adult ministry and so we were doing a whole contemporary service doing that. And it, 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 was, it was step by step by step until we led our first church. And so God leads that way oftentimes. So don't overlook the small opportunities that God will bless that. And here's the last point. Number three, God rewards perseverance. God rewards perseverance. It says this in verse 10, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. I am coming soon. So Jesus moves on here and he talks about how the church of Philadelphia had endured patiently. So if you remember, if you've been here, we've been covering all the other churches. And remember, uh, in most of these churches, Jesus is calling them to repentance. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Thyatira, how they allowed a spirit of Jezebel to come into the church. And they were introducing this false worship of leading church people into prostitution temples. And so here, what Jesus is saying is that the church of Philadelphia, they had persevered. They endured the trials. And he says, because of that, I will keep you from the greater trial that is to come. Now, what is that all about? Well, there's different opinions on this. Um, but I stand on this that I believe what he's talking about here is he's talking about the great tribulation. And you say, well, what's the Great Tribulation? Well, the Great Tribulation is what, if you keep, continue to read in the book of Revelation, is when God will pour out his final judgments upon this earth, where God says enough is enough. And so the, the, God's wrath will be poured on this earth. But before that happens, 
we believe the scripture talks about a catching away of the saints. In 1 Thessalonians, where it talks about that, that, that the trumpet shall call and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are left will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall be with the Lord forever. I say, well, wait a minute. This, this happened thousands of years ago. And so why? That doesn't really fit. I mean, it, it, you know, uh, this church has been long gone. But if we look at this passage and we look at 1 Thessalonians when it's talking about the blessed hope or some people call it the rapture of the church. If you look at this, remember the scripture says the dead in Christ will rise first. And so the church of Philadelphia is included in that. So this promise still applies to them. And this is a universal message. Seven is the number of completeness. So it applies to us today that Jesus will keep us from the hour of trial. And that's why Jesus reminds us of this word, I am coming soon. It's, there's supposed to be an expectancy in the heart of the church that Jesus is coming back and he's coming soon. And so what does this have to do with open doors? Well, we are to persevere until that happens. We're to persevere. Remember, uh, in life, and even the Apostle Paul talks about this, that life is a race. Were anybody else watching the Olympics? Yeah, we've been watching a lot of the Olympics lately. And so life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And the Apostle Paul says to those who are victorious, they will receive a crown, which goes along with this passage in Philadelphia where Jesus does give some sort of a warning here to Philadelphia. And he says, until that time comes, let no one steal your crown. Did you notice that? Persevere. Let no one take your crown. Don't let, don't let anybody take that from you. And, and so uh, going back to this idea of open and closed doors, I think sometimes in life when we experience closed doors and maybe disappointment and dis discouragement, I think sometimes the temptation is, is to give up, to quit. But the, the Bible says don't give up, don't quit, persevere, you can do it. And maybe it's not giving up on your faith, but maybe it's quit praying. Maybe it's, it's quit dreaming. Maybe it's quit serving or ministering. But listen, the Bible says persevere until the end. Run the race. Run the race. Don't let anyone steal your crown. Because here's the final part. I'm going to have the worship team come back up. Because here's the promise. Here's the reward in Revelation chapter 3, 12 through 13. It says, to the one who's victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I don't have a picture of it, but maybe you can Google it. I forgot. But in the modern city of al uh, Philadelphia, what's interesting is, is that there are actually three ancient pillars that still exist from the time of the Church of Philadelphia. There are three ancient pillars that still remain. All the earthquakes, all the times the city has been destroyed and rebuilt, these pillars are still standing today. You can go visit Philadelphia or al here today in Turkey and you can see those pillars, they're still standing. I just find that really cool. That here it is a picture, if you would go there, here, here all these thousands of years, these pillars never crumbled. And that's a picture of the person who perseveres till the end. He says, I'm gonna make you a pillar, a temple of my God. You see the temple, that Jesus is referring to here is, is not a, a new physical temple. He's talking about the new Jerusalem. He's talking about the new heavens and the new earth where, where the new Jerusalem, the city of God comes down, the place where the Bible promises there's gonna be no more pain, no more death, no more tears, no more sorrows. And Jesus will reign in this new Jerusalem for all eternity. And we will reign with him. This is the reward of those who perseveres. So as we close this morning, I want to just sum this all up, sum it all up in one sentence, if I can. This, is, this was a little hard this week as I was trying to put this all together. But here's what I came up with. 
I think as we sum up this passage this morning, I sum it up in this one sentence, that God promises open doors of blessings to those who are willing to be used and persevere. So sum it up in one sentence. God promises open doors of blessings to those who are willing to be used. God use me and will persevere. I want you to know this morning we serve a good God. We may not understand every closed door, but understand maybe God closed that door for a reason to give you a new door of opportunity. Remember, closed doors is not a rejection. It might just be a redirection. So persevere. Be willing to be used. Persevere. Keep the faith. Don't have the wrong mindset that God can never use me. Don't ever have a wrong mindset that this is too small for me. Are you willing? Are you willing to be used? Are you willing to be a vessel that God can use? God promises open doors of blessings to those who are willing to be used and persevere. So I close with this. There's a story in the Old Testament. And it's the story of King Hezekiah. So remember I said there were good kings and there were bad kings. And Hezekiah was one of the good ones. He made some bad decisions, but for the most part, he was one of the good ones. And the scripture says that he gave a key to the royal treasurer, Elikahim. And he was the royal treasurer. So, he, so only Elikahim had the authority. Remember, keys represent authority. It represents access. So he was in, in charge of guarding the treasury of Israel. He was in charge of opening the vault. He was overseeing it. He and he alone had access to the vast riches. And as I was thinking about that, what does that mean for us today? Well, remember, Jesus has the keys of David, amen? He has all authority. And since Jesus has the keys of authority, we go to him because in Christ, there is a treasury that can be found. There is a treasury this morning. So I don't know today what you may be facing today. And you've been praying for some open doors and maybe there seems to be some closed doors. I don't know, maybe you're in between. I just pray today that you go to Christ because he has all the answers. Because in him, there is a treasury of wisdom. In him, there is a treasury of wholeness. If you're broken today, he can make you whole. In Christ, there is a treasury of provision. If you need providing today, there is provision that can be found in Christ. If you need healing today from the past, there is a treasury of healing that is found in his name. Jesus holds the keys. So go to him. Go to him today. Because there are spiritual blessings that we can be found in Christ. Amen? Let's pray.